If you haven't done so yet, pause the video and try to answer the question first on your own before listening on. What we'll do first is actually redraw this just a little bit bigger so we can see exactly what's going on. So here's a representation of the original picture and what we want to do is wherever the light strikes the surface, we want to draw an imaginary line that runs perpendicular to the surface. And it's very important to make sure you make it perpendicular. And what that means, of course, is that it's going to form a nice 90 degree angle. And in fact, this line that we just drew in red here is known as the normal. So we want to do that wherever the light strikes the surface. So we can do that right here as we have just done. And then the light strikes the surface once again down here. So we're going to draw another normal line, making sure that it's perpendicular to the surface of the glass. Now, this angle right here was given to us as being 30 degrees. And in part A of the question, what we want to do is actually look for this angle right here. And for now, we can call that angle theta 2. In order to calculate that angle, we're going to use Snell's law. Let's take a look at that equation. And so in that equation, we have N1, which would represent the index of refraction of the first material that light is traveling in. From the picture, we can call this material 1, and then this material here, where the light is entering, can be material 2. Now, we presume that air is surrounding this block of glass, and the index of refraction for air is actually 1. So what we can say is N1 is equal to 1. When the light enters the glass, there's going to be a different index of refraction that we can call N2, and that was given to us in the question as being 1.5. Also, theta1 is given to us. That is the angle of incidence, which is shown in the diagram as 30 degrees. What we're looking for is theta2. Now, to solve for theta2, we can first divide both sides by N2. And then to get rid of the sine here that's in front of theta2, we take the inverse sine, which is symbolized by sine with a little negative 1. And so we got to make sure we do that on both sides of the equation. On the right side, the inverse sine and the sine will cancel to leave just theta 2. And then at this point, we can plug in the known values. As stated, n1 would just be 1, theta 1 is 30 degrees, and then n2 is 1.5. So making sure your calculator is in degree mode, you can type this into your calculator, and you should get roughly 19.5 degrees for theta 2. So this is the correct answer for part A of the question, and so we can mark it on the diagram. Now part B is asking us for the angle of incidence at the bottom surface, and so that would be down here where the bottom surface of the glass is. The angle of incidence in any situation is always measured with respect to that normal line that we drew. So you have to make sure that the angle that you're going to be calling the angle of incidence is actually touching that normal line. And so this is the angle we're looking for. If we look very carefully, we can see that this red normal line and then this other red normal line are parallel to one another. And it turns out from some basic geometry that when you have two parallel lines that are cut by a third line, that's sometimes called a transversal, then these angles marked here and here will be equal to one another. They're called alternate interior angles for those who are technically savvy, but that angle right there is going to be 19.5 degrees. That is the angle of incidence at the bottom surface and the correct answer to part B. Now, of course, part B also wants the refracted angle as well, not just the angle of incidence. And so that's going to be this angle right here. Again, notice it's touching the normal line. So the refracted angle also is measured with respect to that normal. We can call that angle theta 2. And the angle of incidence at the bottom surface would be theta 1. And then we're just going to follow Snell's law once again. Notice we're starting inside the glass in this part of the problem. And that means that n1 is going to be the 1.5. And then when the light passes through the boundary and enters air, we then have n2 equaling 1. So we'll plug in the known values into Snell's law. Well, I So we'll come back over to Snell's law and isolate theta 2 in the same way we did before. And then after that, we'll plug in the known values. So n1 is 1.5, theta 1 is the 19.5, and then n2 is 1. So you can go ahead and plug this into your calculator. And indeed, you should get about 30 degrees. In fact, you should get exactly 30 degrees. So, so this angle theta 2 down here is going to be 30 degrees. So let's mark that. And so that is indeed the second part of the answer to part B. Now we can move on to part C, which is asking us for the lateral distance D by which the light beam is shifted. 
looking back at the original diagram, we can see that the distance d is marked in the diagram with that with that lowercase d, and that's what we're trying to find. But to find it, we're going to actually work with this picture here since it's a little bit larger and easier to look at. Now to find D, it's somewhat challenging. What we're going to do is take this original incident light ray and we're going to extend it in a perfectly straight line until it strikes the bottom section of the glass. So right about there. And then what we'll do is extend a line from where the second normal line met the bottom of the glass over to the line that we just drew. And indeed, that is the distance that we are looking for. That is the same value that the original diagram had called D. Just to be clear about that, you can go back to the original diagram and the line that we have marked D in our hand-drawn picture is this line right here. And if you look carefully, that line right there is the same distance as what they're asking for. So really, our objective is to find this distance right here. And it turns out to find that distance, we actually want to find this distance first right here, which we'll mark with an orange line. And for now, we can call that orange line H. Of course, the question is, well, how do we find H? And in order to find H, we're actually going to have to draw yet another line, or rather extend a line that we already had drawn. We're going to extend that first normal line until it touches the bottom surface of the glass. Now, we know the length of that line right there in red that we had just extended. That's actually just the full thickness of the glass, which was two centimeters. So we can go ahead and mark that red line from here down to there as being two centimeters. And remember, our objective right now is to find this distance h before we can actually find d. Now you can hopefully see that we've made a nice right triangle right here. Maybe we can color it in for emphasis. And so basically we're looking for the hypotenuse of that green right triangle that we just shaded in. And we can find that because we know this angle right here. That was the 19.5 degrees. And if we look carefully at that angle, we can see that the adjacent side to that angle is two centimeters long and we're looking for the hypotenuse. So the trig function that involves adjacent and a hypotenuse of course is cosine. So again looking at that 19.5 degree angle we can say that the cosine of that 19.5 degree angle is equal to the adjacent side which is the two centimeters divided by the hypotenuse. We can multiply both sides of that equation by h so that the h is cancel on the right side and then divide both sides by cosine of 19.5. And then you can pick up your calculator and punch in 2 divided by cosine 19.5, and you should get about 2.12 centimeters. Now that's not the answer, that's the value of h, but now that we have that, we're gonna be able to find d. So this time we're gonna be looking at a different right triangle. So let's maybe color this one in again for emphasis. And so now we're looking at the pink triangle. We know the value of h, we're looking for d. And the angle that we're going to be working with is going to be this angle right here. Now, it's somewhat tricky to find that angle. And so let's try, to, let's try to do that. So we can see that there's a 30 degree angle right here. Now it turns out that from here to here is also going to be 30 degrees. You probably want to pause the video and make sure that that makes sense. But basically we're taking advantage of the concept of vertical angles. So whenever you have two crisscrossing lines, whatever this angle is right here, would be the same as this angle right here. And so the two crisscrossing lines in this case are right there, that black line, and then right there. Those are the two crisscrossing lines. And hopefully we can see that if this is 30 degrees, then this one's also 30. Now, we already know this is 19.5, so if we take 30 degrees and subtract the 19.5, that's going to give us this inside angle here in the pink right triangle. And of course, 30 minus 19.5 is 10.5 degrees. So now that we have that, let's use some trigonometry. We'll notice that D is opposite of that 10.5 degree angle, and H is the hypotenuse. So this time we're going to be using sine. So we can say that the sine of that 10.5 degree angle is going to equal the opposite side, which is D, over the hypotenuse of that pink right triangle, which was H. We found H to be 2.12 centimeters. We'll multiply both sides of this equation by 2.12, and we will be able to finally solve for D here. And when you do that, you should get about 0.386 centimeters. So this is the correct answer to part C of the question. And now on to part D, which asks us to determine the speed 
of the light in glass, which is going to equal the speed of light divided by the index of refraction of the glass. Now, of course, the speed of light is a known value of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and the index of refraction of glass was given to us as being 1.5. And when we work that out, we should get 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this would be the correct answer to part D. Now, for part E, the time required for the light to pass through the glass block, we could set up the basic equation that time is equal to the distance traveled divided by the speed. Now, notice the light as it travels through the block is actually traveling along this path right here. That was the path that we had marked h. And we found that distance h. We had determined that it was 2.12 centimeters. Of course, we want to convert that back into meters, so we can say that 1 meter is 100 centimeters. And then we're going to divide that by the speed that we had just found, which was 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that will turn out to be 1.06 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So this would be the correct answer to part E. And finally, is the travel time through the block affected by the angle of incidence? Well, they're talking about that original 30 degree angle. And indeed, the correct answer will be yes. And the reason for that is, as we change that 30 degree angle to some other value, that's actually going to change the angle of refraction. And if the angle of refraction changes, then the distance h also will change. So for example, if the angle of refraction was smaller, then h would actually be this distance right here. Whereas if the angle of refraction were greater, then h would take on a larger value, such as this. And so certainly, since these distances are different, then the time required to travel them will also be different. So the correct answer for part f is definitely yes.